Thank you, guys. Hi, morning. Um, it's I actually grew up in in Joburg. Uh, I've been in Cape Town for the last ten years, and I forgot how stunning Joburg Springs are. So it's it's pretty amazing. Who is here from from out of town? Who's like not from Joburg? Nice, <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, any Durbanites here? Okay, too busy checking one. Okay, well, I don't know if that counts to me. Okay. Cool, thank you. So yeah, my name's Greg. Um, I work for Code for South Africa, um, and I'm gonna be taking you through exactly what we do, and, and we use Python a lot, um, and how we use Python pragmatically uh, to support social change. Um, a bit about me, I spent, uh, I, I studied here at WITS. I, I then went overseas, did a master's overseas, came back, I worked for Amazon down in Cape Town for six years, um, and then I went from building big distributed systems to building really, really small systems that run on one machine, um, and I like to think of it going from big data to really small data. Um, and it's been a really interesting development and, and sort of evolution. So I'm really excited to talk to you about what we do and what it means and, and how we do it. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, cool. I will try to talk slowly. Um, like most geeks, I talk really quickly. Okay. Um, so that's where we work. That is, uh, those are our offices. We work under a bridge in Claremont in Cape Town. It's called CodeBridge. It's a civic hack lab. Um, it's got free Wi-Fi, you can buy desk, well, buy desk time by the hour or by the month, so you can drop by and, and hack with us. Uh, we actually have bubble wrap on the windows to keep it warm in winter. Um, it gives us a certain edge, right? <laughs> um, so not everyone in Cape Town like works on the mountain or under the mountain, or we're under the bridge. Um, so Code for South Africa, we're, a, as I said, a non-profit, um, and we use technology and data to promote informed decision-making in the support of social change. Uh, so, okay, what the heck does that mean? Here's an example. So this is a tool we built called Living Wage. Uh, we launched this in partnership with News24 about six months ago. Um, and the whole premise behind it is that most of us, I mean, if, if you're, when you're paying your domestic worker, how do you work out what to pay your domestic worker? Is that an informed decision that you make? So the idea behind this is not to say you should be paying your domestic worker X, but saying what factors should you take into account when you're paying that domestic worker, right? We launched this, News24 put it out. It is accompanied by an amazing uh, piece of journalism by um, a, a journalist of ours, Kim Harrisburg. Um, and it's really simple. You dial up the slider, you say, this is what I pay per month or pay per day. And it says, yeah, you're probably paying, you know, 50% of the domestic worker's living wage or 150% if you're doing better. And that's based on some research uh, an MBA intern of ours did um, looking at a basket of, of goods to get basic uh, nutrition, looking at transport costs, which are very high, um, looking at living costs and that sort of thing. So it's really simple, right? All we're trying to say here is, you know, dial it in, see what you should be doing. This generated a huge amount of controversy. This is a huge uh, touch point for South Africans. Um, a lot of people have domestic workers. It's really not particularly well re regulated and people don't understand it well. It had 15,000 page views on the first day, which is really high. Um, in, in South Africa, it had uh, hundreds of comments, some of them horrible. Um, they, and actually News24, two or three days ago, they launched a follow-up to this because they put out a, forum, uh, a, a form where people could say, this is how much I actually pay, and they got over 12,000 responses to that form. I mean, who fills in online forms on the internet, right? Um, thankfully, they've taken away the comment section of News24 and saved us that. Um, anyway bit of informed decision making for, for everyone that we can use today. Next time you pay your domestic worker, go home, take a look at this and see how much maybe should I be paying them. There's another tool which can really touch close to home. This is called the Medicine Price Register. Uh, we're looking for a much better name, it's horrible. Um, NPR.codeforce, you can type in the name of a prescription drug. Lamictin is an anticonvulsant. Um, and it'll tell you how much you should be paying for that drug in South Africa. This is um, possible because the South African government makes this information available. It's in a rather hard to understand spreadsheet, so we pull it out of that spreadsheet, pop it onto a web-based tool, this is Python in the back end, um, and you can see how much should you be paying because prices are regulated in South Africa. You can also find generics, which is really useful. So if you're being prescribed a particularly expensive medicine, um, my dog was prescribed eye drops a few days ago and they didn't have the cheaper version, so we paid twice what we would have paid for the generic, and I found that out by looking here. Um, and that's a human eye drop solution. Um, I actually, this is really interesting in terms of in, in informed decision making. We thought the general public would be really interested in this. 
Uh, and a while ago, I broke this site by mistake, and we got an email from a doctor saying, where is it? I use it every day because he prescribes medicines to people in poor areas, and he wants to make sure he's prescribing affordable medicines. So it's a really powerful way of actually making change here. So as I said, it's just Python under the hood. It's a um, simple database and some Python. Uh, it's a Flask app. As I said, I've gone from big data to small data, and it turns out actually local data is really important. So location, location, location. If you can make information local to people, it really impacts them heavily, and it's actually really meaningful for them, and they can take action with that. So if you can tell people something about where they live, their neighborhood, their neighbors, themselves, where their children go to school, what hospitals they should be going to or could go to, they can take action on that far more effectively than if you're talking at a very national level. So we had crime statistics released recently. At a national level, that's interesting for, from a policymaker's standpoint. From a personal level, we want to know what the crimes are like in our neighborhoods so that we can choose where to buy our houses. That's very powerful. So in that spirit, we have a tool called WiseyMap, wiseymap.co.za, um, from the Zulu word Ulwazi for knowledge. And the goal behind this is to help people understand South Africa through the eyes of data, primarily here through the eyes of the census, the 2011 census. It's still pertinent information, it's still useful. So this is the ward in which we're sitting, we're sitting about there, and this is the ward uh, that, that we occupy. Um, so we've got this information the whole way from a national level down to provincial, municipality, the whole way down to ward level. And it's got some really great info here. If I could scroll, if this wasn't you know, crappy PowerPoint, um, there, it's mobile friendly. You can take a look at it right now. Please do. Um, we can see what languages people speak here. How do they vote? What's their income like? What's the general age? What's the general gender balance? There's some places in South Africa, particularly the mines, which are heavily skewed towards men. Um, Educational background, how many children are going to school when they should be going to school? How many child-headed households are there? There's a whole bunch of really interesting information which you can make really local. It's really, I use this when I go on a road trip. I'm like, okay, tell me a bit about this place that I'm going to now, and you can get some really great stats about it. And you can make some informed decisions about what you're going to do there, and you know, if you want to move to a place or something. Um, we, we know that uh, nonprofits are using this to, to, help their, the, to help their target audiences. Uh, political parties use this to work out canvassing, and we're starting to push this as an educational tool for teaching statistics and maths and geography in, in high schools. There's a lot of interest around that. In terms of Python, this is a Django app under the hood. This is built on a tool called Census Reporter, used very similarly in the States, so they did a whole lot of awesome work. Um, so it's Django. We have another service which is free to use, which gives us the boundaries for these things. So you can go to the service if you want to do any sort of interactive stuff like this on a web page. You want to play around with some crime data, some anything where you need to draw a boundary around a municipality, or you want to say, show me all the wards in this municipality. Show me all the municipalities in this uh, province. We've got a free API. It's a REST API. It's run uh, off, off of um, Django. That'll let you do that really easily. You can also grab a lot of this data if you want to play with it yourself. Um, because we can't do everything here. This platform actually does a whole bunch. It shows you tables of information. It shows you um, distributions and histograms. Uh, if you want, you can get hold of that data in KML, in GeoJSON, uh, in CSV, and Excel, and so you can play with it yourself and build on it. Here's another project which is really about local information uh, called Open Bylaws. Who here owns four or more dogs at home? <laughs> Anyone? If you own four or more dogs, in, in this particular case in Johannesburg, you actually have to buy a license. You have to register them. If you have under four, you're fine. If you own four more cats, same thing. Turns out bylaws are far more interesting to people day to day than national legislation. They impact how many pets you can own. They impact how loud uh, you can be at a party. They impact you, how the city can claim tariffs back from you if you haven't paid them, when they can evict you. It impacts or tells you what you can do in a park, whether you can go and randomly plant, plant stuff in a park. You can, the park, the, 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 that whatever you plant, actually then becomes a property of uh, the city. So this information is, is really useful and it can really impact businesses and individuals. So the project, or the idea here is that we're making this stuff far more accessible than it currently is. Municipalities are meant to put this online. They either do so in poor formats, it can be literally a scan, it's a PDF with an image in it, and that image is a scanned copy of what it looked like when it was published in the Gazette. 
right? So that's searchable. Um, <laughs> so what we do is we do the hard work. We've built a um, Python-based um, platform behind this called Indigo, which um, the African Legal Information Institute is using to consolidate uh, the national legislation, and we're using it for local legislation. Um, and it just makes this information readable, accessible, shareable, it's well formatted, you can search for it, um, you can download it in PDF again if you really want. Um, again, just another way of taking information that's out there, doesn't need to be sort of really hard to find information, and making it accessible to people to help them make informed decisions. So as I said, I'm a developer, I, I lead the tech side at code for essay so let's talk some tech here. Um, <coughs> I think we're incredibly lucky today in the choice of technical resources we have before us. We have a huge range of languages on the back end and on the front end that we can do stuff in. And they're basically these days, for, for most use cases, unless you're working at extremes, they're all much of a muchness, right? You can build in Ruby, you can build in Java, you can build in Python. On the front end, you've got a whole number of JavaScript frameworks. Since I started this talk, there have been three more JavaScript frameworks launched, guaranteed. Right? We're spoiled for choice. And I think because of that, we're lucky enough that we don't need to evaluate those um, or, make, uh, or choose a technology based purely on technical um, merits alone. We should actually be baking it, basing it on slightly different merits, right? non-technical merits. And the things we focus on are things like learning curve. How hard is it for us to pick this technology up? There are only two developers at Code for Essay, and we run more than 20 websites. So it's really important that when we jump from one website to another, we can remember how to pick it up really easily. When someone new joins us and comes in and works on something for a little while, we do all of our work is open source. So when we get a, a someone external to come in and play with something, how quickly can they learn something, right? So Angular has a very steep learning curve. We chose not to use Angular. Community and documentation. Documentation is critical. If we build Anything ourselves that we, you know, let's say we choose a particular way to deploy our code or something like that. If we build that from scratch, we have to document it. That takes time, that takes effort. So if there's an existing framework out there that maybe does 80% of what we need but is well documented, we'll choose to use that. Because it means we don't have to worry about doing that. There's mind share around that. When someone comes in from the outside, they've probably done something like that. They've maybe read the Heroku docs if we're using Heroku, which I'll talk about. Um, so we don't have to worry about doing those things. What's the rate of change of that project? Right? If that project is changing boom, boom, boom the whole time, we can't afford to keep up with that. We're only two people. We're not focused on one project the whole time. We're focused on a huge range of them. And if in six months' time I come back to a project and try and pick it up, and actually that framework has now changed completely, so Angular, it's gone from one to two and it's changed absolutely everything, that's a huge problem for us. So we choose not to be bleeding edge. We're pragmatic about that. We choose to be a little bit more further back, and we sort of let things settle down, then we're going to pick up the good stuff as it comes out of that. Finally, maintainability. How hard is it for us to build projects and then maintain them over time, given a certain framework or a choice of technology? Again, that's really important. As I said, you know, we come back to a project in six months' time, or just, you know, yesterday we need to quickly put in a bug fix for something. If it's really hard for me to understand how that project worked again, or how we were using a certain piece of technology, or how to deploy, it's, it really is going to cost me a huge amount of time and clients and partners money to actually make that change. So maintainability is really important for us. So OK, given those constraints, what do we actually choose to build with? We start at the very beginning doing something maybe a bit different to other technology companies. We choose not to build as far as possible. right? What I love about this day and age is that static websites are cool again. And I think that's very powerful, right? There are no moving parts. You're not going to get paged when a static website falls over, right? Um, unless it's GitHub falling over. There's nothing I can do about that. It's highly unlikely they're going to fall over. Yeah, S3 has the odd, you know, the odd issue. Guaranteed our servers are going to have more issues than S3. Um, so that open bylaw site, that's hosted on S3. We have a, um, a little Ruby app. Um, don't bash it, that was before my Python time, um, which pulls everything from the Python API, builds a bunch of static web pages. This is all done on the Travis CI integration server, so we don't have to do it, and it pushes it to S3, and it just works. And the beauty there is we're touching every single web page as we build it. So if there's going to be a bug, we're going to hit it, that build's going to fail. So there's not going to be any bugs out in production that we don't know about unless it's on the client side. Um, 
I really feel if you're today hosting a static website yourself on your own servers, you're doing something wrong, right? Um, it's very easy to build something on GitHub pages and, and put it out there. Hosting your docs on read the docs, beautiful, all static, right? This is a very powerful way of doing things. It's very simple and it means we don't have to build anything. We don't, and, I, and on top of that, GitHub pages is very well documented. We don't have to document how we use GitHub pages, right? There's all this documentation around GitHub pages, which is great. What about when we actually do choose to build, right? When a website can't just be a static website. So we use Django heavily. Occasionally we use a bit of Flask. Um, this is a pragmatic choice. I'm not actually a huge Django fan. One of the primary reasons we're using Django, and I mean, I'd love to have a Django bash session or discussion session later on. Um, I really want to hear that. I, I, I honestly feel it's, it's doing web development like 10 years ago and a lot of other frameworks are doing it better. And I really think Django has a huge opportunity to improve and improve the state of web development for Python. But anyway, I won't get into that. But the reason that we chose Django is because of all the things I listed before. There's a very large community around it. It's well documented. There are a lot of plugins available for it. There's a lot of that great stuff going on. Personally, I find Flask much simpler to work with. There's not a bigger community around it. A lot of people don't know Flask when they come in, so it's harder to pick up. So we choose Django. Very pragmatic choice there. Um, our websites aren't particularly large, right? So a lot of the time they'll run on a Heroku instance. We used to use Heroku for these things until Heroku changed their pricing plan and basically you couldn't run things for free in a particularly effective way anymore. But actually, that wasn't a huge problem. Because we were using Heroku, Heroku is very sort of, uh, they, they're quite opinionated in how they've decided to do dependencies and that sort of thing and, in, and configuration um, through environment variables. And that's well documented, right? People know it, people understand it, it's very easy for people to work with it. And um, Docker has a, uh, a little plugin called Doku, which basically mimics Heroku on Docker. So it's almost trivial for us to take a project off of Heroku and get it up and running on Doku because it uses very same concepts. Requirements are, oh well, you know, dependencies are in requirements.txt, it does a pip install, we get a bit of a few hooks here and there, configuration is through environment variables, it's very straightforward forward for us to use this. This has saved us an immense amount of time. Before we went this way, every product, project was deployed slightly differently. We're using Fabric slightly differently, which meant when you're trying to jump from project to project to work out, okay, I've got to change. I need to push this out now. Okay, how do I push this out? You have to go read the docs again. Now, this is standardized. It's well known. It's simple. It's a git push, and you're good. Very useful. Um, I spent way too much of my six years at Amazon maintaining databases, right? Databases running at scale are very hard to maintain. I am very happy to pay Amazon to maintain databases for me. They do backups for me. Fantastic. So we use Postgres and MySQL heavily. Um, we use, uh, for all our uh, GIS stuff, we use PostGIS, so we, we rely a lot on Postgres. Um, and then we use Excel. Uh, what's that doing on this list, right? Um, and I want to dig into that a bit more, right? So I'm all about being pragmatic. My notes here say, most pragmatic thing ever that we've ever done. This is incredibly powerful, right? How many times have you guys built something for a client or for someone internally, and then they say, okay, so we need a web page where I can download this report. Cool, we put it together. Okay, hmm. We also need the sum of these values there. And uh, that sum, that needs to be an average. And then, and then I want to be able to cut this by, by like quarter or by this category. And you're adding more and more filters and cuts and dices and slices to your data, right? That's a pivot table, right? Instead of us spending a huge amount of time and money trying to build web interfaces for building complex reports so that people can actually answer business questions and take action on those, the most powerful thing we found to do is say, here's the raw data. Educate the users around what that raw data means to them and how to use it in Excel. And it's a very powerful thing to do. And that was a big thing for me as a techie to sort of try and get my head around because going, but we can program that. We can build that. Why would I want to use Excel? Excel is for like management people. It's incredibly powerful. It's a very pragmatic, easy way of saying to someone, here's all your data, and they're empowered now to do things with it and make informed decisions with it. I highly recommend, if you're building any sort of application that really warehouses data, give your users a way to pull that data out and work with it in a format that they can understand. There's a tweet I saw recently, which I think I really 
well, I retweeted it. I support it hugely, right? A lot of money has been wasted in that sort of thing. There's a talk going around at the moment by Joel Spolsky of Trello and Stack Overflow fame, uh, and it's called You Suck at Excel. I really, even if you think you know Excel, even basically take a look at it, it's really, really interesting. He does a great job of presenting it. And one of the things he says towards the end is this, right? That at least once every three months is a startup that tries to reinvent pivot tables, right? They say, it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna tie into this and it's gonna tie into that and it'll be able to slice and dice and we'll sell it for 500 bucks a pop and it's pivot tables, right? If you don't know pivot tables or if, if you're working in an organization where people need to work with data and you're responsible for giving them information and reports, do yourself a favor and teach them basic pivot tables. It's, it's Google MapReduce in, you know, in, in a little app. Very powerful stuff. So one of the big problems we have when we're presenting data to people in something like Excel is the assumption that people are sort of uh, numerally literate, if you will, right? They can work with data. And we work a lot with other civic organizations. So we'll work with the likes of Black Sash um, or a whole bunch of other organizations where when they're working with their communities, those communities don't necessarily know what a graph actually means. They don't know what a percentage is. So it can be really challenging to actually give them data and say to them, well, you know, clearly this makes sense. These two are in ratio with each other or this increased, you know, um, or something per capita. These words don't mean anything to them. So that can be a big challenge for us. So working out exactly how to do that can be tricky. And even when we're working with these organizations that do understand percentages and graphs, um, they might not have Excel skills. And it amazes me how powerful teaching someone something like Excel can be. You can take people who are desperate for informed decisions. They know they should be making informed decisions um, with data that they have available. They don't know how, and you just give it to them in Excel, teach them how to use Excel, and it completely liberates them and empowers them to do it themselves. And I think the big takeaway here for me was that you don't need to build complicated things to help people. You can build really simple things sometimes and let them use what tools they have at their disposal to, to really make powerful use of it. Okay, so that's how we um, work to try and help other people make better decisions. So we actually try not to work with uh, sort of the, the man on the street as it were. We'll prefer to work with an organization which has a constituency and knows them well um, and support them in doing their job better. So as I said, we run about 20 sites and uh, apps and services. Um, some of them are static websites, some of them are websites, some of them are APIs. Uh, we have two developers. Um, we actually have a, are a team of about seven or eight, um, but actual technical developers. It's only two of us, and to keep this going, this is a bit of a challenge, so we're making these pragmatic choices. So we're a part of a larger movement, which I wanna talk a bit about, called civic technology. And I thought at this point in the talk, you know what I needed was like a Venn diagram because you know that's a great way to explain things. Uh, and then I thought, you know what, I'll just use my traffic find instead. So this is a text message I got a couple of months ago from the city of Cape Town saying, traffic find blah, 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 for ID blah, blah, is outstanding, I owe them 400 rand. This is a prime example of civic technology. This is technology helping citizens interact more effectively with where they live, with their local government, with their national government, anything like that. Um, and this is sort of a new, it's, it's a new field globally. Right now going on in San Francisco, there's a Code for America Summit. There's the partner or organization similar to Code for South Africa called Code for America. Um, and they're really pushing civic technology hard in government. And they're making incredible strides to make, to help citizens work more effectively with government and to make government work more more effectively and cheaply and simply, right? We know the power of what a mobile application or a web application can do, right? We take it for granted that we can check weather, that we can, we can read tweets, we can log into GitHub, we can do all of these things on our phones and our desktops, right? How many times have you found it like a pleasant experience to actually go and pay city power online or work out what you owe them online or file a complaint online, right? We know those things could be so much better. And we now are starting to have an opportunity to change that. So this is the gov.uk website, okay? Um, 
they really led this change. It's incredible. What they have done is they, a guy called Mike Bracken managed to spearhead this. He managed to convince someone sufficiently high up in the UK government that they needed to pull in all their IT, well, not IT, all their web development, all their service provisioning, all their website stuff under one roof, under one team, and they're going to focus it. And this is the result. Their website is targeted at pe solving people's problems. Okay? Um, and this is really interesting because they took this perspective of the website for a lot of the people in the UK, and it doesn't always map exactly locally, but I think they're parallels. This website is the face of government for British citizens. Right? When you want to go pay your taxes, you do it online. When you want to apply for a driver's license, you do it online. They realize that this is how people interact with government. This needs to be the face of government. So what they said is, we're going to build one set of technologies that everybody uses. What if no, not everyone's online? Okay? So especially the elderly, they're not, maybe not online. Um, maybe they want to call into a call center and do it there. The call center staff, use this website. What if they want to go in person into a tax center to get help with their tax? The tax center staff use the same website. So it's actually much cheaper for them. Right? So it's really focused on service delivery. They've done an amazing job of this. Um, the bulk, uh, there's a lot of Ruby, there's a lot of Python as well. Um, this is all done under the auspices of government digital service in the UK. If you're interested in this sort of thing, if you're interested in how they use technology, and really, if you're interested in trying to drive organizational change in a very, very slow-moving organization like government, they succeeded in doing that. And their blog has a lot of great information on how to do that. Um, their, their Twitter account, their links to their blog. It's a really interesting way of taking Agile and pulling it into government and making it work. Yep, the, the, a lot of their stuff is open source. Um, really, I mean, what they've done is, is just is mind-blowing. Um, and I'm really hoping in 10 years' time we're standing up there doing a talk saying, look at what the South African government did. I hope so. I believe we can. Talking of the South African government, so this is an advert from the Sunday newspaper a week ago. Right? This is an ad for, it's a tender um, for, from Sanral. They are looking for people to come in and do advertising and media buying and that sort of thing. And that seems pretty reasonable, right? The first thing you need to be able to do, provision of communications, public relations, content generation, seems reasonable. Provision of advertising, marketing, and media buying services, that's good. People need to know what Sanral does or what every government website does, who they are, what their mandate is, how to contact them. There's important marketing information in there. Design and construction of Sanral's corporate website, hosting, support, and digital media services, including social media. They've taken what should be a service delivery channel and it's completely coupled together with marketing. This, I think, is a dominant sort of uh, theme of what digital means in South Africa. It's still very much focused on marketing. And I think that's a problem. I think that needs to change. It's also a huge opportunity for marketing firms, for them to turn themselves around and say, okay, instead of just offering a way of um, reaching out to, to potential customers and saying this is what we do or doing press releases, actually saying how can we help our clients deliver their services more effectively online? I would love to see these two things separated out. I'm not bashing marketing, it's very important. But the fact that marketing and construction of a website and hosting and support and digital media are all lumped together doesn't make sense to me. Those are quite fundamentally different things. One of the GDS design principles is, they've got eight or nine of them, is build digital services, not websites. And that's how they capture that, the essence of that, right? The point is not to build a website. I think we all know that. Like very few of us sort of believe that all a website is is a marketing tool anymore. It's a way of delivering services. And we have to start convincing local governments that they need to change that as well. And I think this is our responsibility to change this. We know that things could be better. And we should be the ones. Not, we don't have to go out there, and I'm going to be pragmatic here. We don't have to go out there and, and, and change everyone. We don't have to try and go to government and say, you must change. What I think we can do is start showing them what's possible. Showing them what's possible in the realms in which they work. Right? And I'll get to some examples of how you guys can contribute to that later. Because I think that slowly will convince them, oh, this does need to change. And not only does it need to change, it can change. And these are the benefits that we can get from it. Code for South Africa is part of a much larger international network that is doing this sort of thing, that is trying to improve how government works internationally. As I mentioned, we've got on the far left there, that's Code for America. They're having their summit right now in San Francisco. Um, 
there's, there's Code for Caribbean. We're hoping to have our annual summit there next year. It was in New York last year. Um, there are a whole bunch of partners across Africa. Africa is doing some great work in this area. Um, there's Code for Nigeria, Code for Africa in general, who um, we partner with, Code for Kenya, um, Code for Pakistan, Code for Taiwan, Code for Japan, uh, Code for Australia. So we're not alone in this. Like there's an incredible movement internationally putting this forward. And they all do it in their own slightly different way, which I love. Right? In South Africa, we have a particular political context. Um, in Pakistan, that context is slightly different. Um, and so their approaches are a little bit different, but we can all learn from that. Um, America works heavily with government. It's much harder for us to work with government. So we do a lot of work with data journalists and journalists in general and, and promoting data journalism to try and get journalists to say, like, when crime stats come out, how do you effectively tell the story around crime stats? Um, what's very interesting to me is in the data journalism space, um, and there's some great stuff going on uh, in, on The Guardian in the UK. The entire, basically, the entire Guardian platform in the UK is open source, and it's a lot of it's Python. It's very interesting to me, given that the dominant narrative around building websites, I think, in, in Europe and in, in uh, the States, is with Ruby, that data journalism focuses a lot more on Python. They're doing some great work using pandas, um, building tools like uh, plugins for flasks that you can take a website and freeze it into static pages so they can host on S3 and that sort of thing. Um, that we've got some links off of our website if you're interested in that. There's some really neat stuff going on. So we work at the intersection of there's open data, there's sort of civic technology, there's open government or Gov 2.0 as Tim O'Reilly used to call it. Um, and this is really just getting going and it's a very exciting time to sort of be involved in, in this intersection. So there are a whole bunch of things that factor in here. Um, I'm not an open source zealot. I think open source is important, but I also understand that you know, when your secret source is locked up in, in your source code, you need to protect that. You need to make money out of that. That's cool. But I do think there's an enormous opportunity here for open source and service providers and technology providers and government to come together and actually build something better. There's economic opportunities here. Um, there are a bunch of startups in the States which are focusing on this area of helping government be more effective. Um, so how can you get involved? You can play with your city's data. I really recommend this. This taught me a lot about what my city does for me. I used to think, ah, they're, they're useless, right? It turns out they do a whole bunch of really awesome stuff. The city of Cape Town is the first city in the country to have an open data portal. They've got things, air quality information on there. They've got water quality. They have um, all the transit information for the My City buses. Uh, they have GIS information for every single street address in the city of Cape Town, which is very cool. Find that data. Play with that data. I've got some inspiration coming up in a sec I'll show you. But there's actually a lot of fun to be had there. If you're interested in playing with data and running stats, there's a lot of cool data out there. If you want to build visualizations, you want to build some websites and just play with this, there's a lot of great ways of doing that. Um, open Data Durban is just getting off the ground. They're working with the city of Durban to promote their open data portal, and they're actually, I think, going to pip city of Cape Town and do a better job. So, you know, a little bit of healthy rivalry, I think, is, is great there. Um, they, there's information on legislation. There's information on budgets. Um, national budgets, not super interesting, as I said to the man on the street. Local budgets? They tell you like how much money is being spent on the park down the road. Um, how much money should be being spent? Is it being spent? Um, it, th there's an opportunity here for, for transparency, but there's also an opportunity, I think, for sort of the average Joe to understand what their city does for them and maybe help them do a, a better job of it. So this is a tool that um, Chris Wong uh, in New York City, he got through a freedom of information request, which is a bit like our PIA process. He got the, all the information for every single taxi ride in New York City for 2013. 11 terabytes of information. And he played with it. This got him a new job, one he loves. He hated his previous job. Right? He played with this on the side. He learned a whole bunch of he, He's not a programmer. He comes from a sort of a city planning background. And so this is just tracking the life of one taxi, a random taxi, a day in its life during 2013. And it's really interesting. There's some great stuff here, right? He built this whole thing. There's, there's, um, there's leaflet here under the hood. There's a whole bunch of JavaScript on, on the client side. Um, there's some interesting big table queries going on here. There's like a lot of data here which you can get to play with cool technologies with. And it might find you your next job, which I think is really important. And if there's one thing you take away from here is, is have a side project that you play with. It's certainly got me, my current job. Here's something a bit different. 
This is Amsterdam. This is the age of all the cities in Amsterdam. Uh, sorry, <laughs> this is the age of all the buildings in Amsterdam. Um, and they date from before pre-1800 pre, um, pre up to sort of newer than 2005 there. I'm sure there's this data set for South African cities. I'd love to see that. I'm very curious. What does it look like? Sandton is going to look brand new compared to the other things. What do townships look like? Right? If you're interested in playing with, uh, with chloropleth maps or, or leaflets or JavaScript on the client, this is a great opportunity to go and do those things. If you're interested in playing with GIS information, because you generally get this stuff and it's not well formatted or you need to work out polygons and stuff like that, there's a whole bunch of fun data to be had here. Right? So as I said, like, I want to be pragmatic here. I'm not expecting people to step out there and go and you know, stand up in the streets and say, you know, I want social change and, and uh, we need to change how the city delivers services. Start playing with this. Start raising awareness. And something good will come from that. 40 years ago, I don't think any of us would have been in the position we're in now. 40 years from now, things could be very different. Maybe we don't get as paid as much as we are right now because we're in high demand as programmers. Right? I think it's incredible that uh, this combination of chance and luck and skill and dedication and work have come together at this particular time such that as programmers, as, te as technologists, we have an incredible amount of power in the world today. We are in super high demand. We can use that for, to help people's lives, we can change people's lives, we can have an impact on their lives. And I think it's really important that we use that. And as I said, it doesn't have to be big. Just start looking at this, start playing with it. Maybe it's an idea for a new startup, maybe it's just you playing with new data and new technologies, but doing it in the open. I think it's incredible, incredibly huge opportunity for us, and I really hope you take advantage of it. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, are there any questions for Greg? Yep. Well. Um, can, can I have somebody, who, a volunteer, to pass the mic around? <laughs> uh, just a really quick comment. I was in government at the time when that all came out, um, and you've actually just joined a circle for me. It was sold as a cost-saving exercise, so I worked in the nuclear industry, and we managed a load of domains, and we had to get rid of them because we were told government was going to cut right down on them and hand them over, and we were never told the good side of it. So it's really interesting that it was actually sold as a giant cost-saving exercise so if from a government point of view if that's how you have to do it. Uh, and it was obviously 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 when it all happened. So yep. uh, Maybe that was the catalyst that was needed, right? That Mike Bracken could go in there and he could say, actually, we're going to save a huge amount of cost, and they have. because And they actually do some great stuff. Um, Gov, this is GovUK. They publish the cost saving associated with each of their services. So essentially, they've worked out the cost per transaction of you applying for a British visa. If you're applying for a British visa, you're using this new technology. And they can say, this is the cost saving that this transaction, that this new technology has given us for this particular service. They're really open with their analytics. Um, so government digital services in the UK, has they, they kicked this off. And in the last year, there's been a similar launch in the US, the US digital services. And they're trying to do the same thing. And that really came out of the whole Obamacare sort of catastrophe when they launched that website. Good. Um, sorry, just um, a comment more than a question, but thank you. A great uh, talk and great work. Um, just, I also use Excel every day, but um, if you need to pivot things in Python, look at pandas. I mean, it, it's great. And if you need some um, strategies for pivoting data that won't fit in memory, come to my talk this afternoon on split apply combine. <laughs> Cheeky, I like it. <laughs> um, but GitHub Pages now shows Pandas notebooks, uh, or Python notebooks in GitHub, which I think is, oh sorry, GitHub itself shows them, which I think is awesome. Yeah, Pandas. Very good. Uh, your web applications have a lot of data, and the data changes daily or weekly or so. How do you guys make sure all your websites stay up to date? And is it all automated, or a lot of humans involved? I would love to say it's automated. There are a lot of humans involved. <laughs> Things like medicine prices, those are updated every quarter or so. So that's, we pull down that, uh, we've got some scripts to go through it and update that manually. Um, 
the legislation stuff that we have to capture manually because there's a bit of a process there. We've, we've built tooling to make it really easy. And actually, if you're interested in, in legislation, please come and chat. We're looking for partners to help um, build the bylaws uh, that we have across the country, like Durban and Complete Joburg set and stuff. Um, we don't have a huge amount of, uh, of automation around updating our data sets right now. Um, we need to get better at that. Um, so say like the census information for, for, for WiseMap. Um, that is currently fairly manual. There are actually the, the, the uh, JavaScript libraries for tying into that data and pulling it out of the data set, which I'd love to try and automate. So it's open source if you want to help. That would be awesome. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Thank you for such great positive work. I just wanted to find out how do you guys find the operations? You mean like? To make money. Oh, find the R operations. That's a good question. So I came from six years in corporate, and then I went into the nonprofit world, and I was like, how does this work? Um, so the way we're funded, we have a 50-50 model. We are funded through some core funding from a media network, um, which helps us cover core costs and core salaries. Um, the other 50% of that is essentially through the work we do. So a lot of the time, a partner will come to us, and they'll say, like African Lee, they're doing the legislation, and they've got a grant to implement something. And they'll come to us with the grant, and we'll help them implement and we really try hard to make that money go as far as possible because often these grants are small. Um, it'll be 40,000 US dollars or something, which is really quite small for building a large software platform. It could be 5,000 US dollars for some of the stuff we do. 50,000 Rand is nothing. Um, so yeah, we, we mix those two models and the core funding helps us do stuff which we feel needs to be done, but you can't fund in a for-profit way. So I just want to say a lot of people think non-profit means like we're free. We're not free. It's, it's, it's expensive to build technology. We need to, you know, people need to go home and put food on their plates and that sort of thing. Um, what we do, though, is we bend over backwards to use that money as, as efficiently and effectively as possible. And any profit we make, we obviously put back into their business. Nonprofit simply means there's, there's no shareholders, um, there are no shares, there's, there's no profit is not our motive. Uh, yeah, just a, a lot of talk about, uh, sorry, a lot of talk about Excel. Um, if, 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 yeah, sorry, a lot of talk about Excel. Um, uh, what do you think of the LibreOffice alternative? I'm just thinking in terms of proposing it as a solution to a company. They might not want to pay licensing fees, things like that. Is, is it good enough? Not. I mean, Can you do pivot tables in LibreOffice? <laughs> no, not at the moment, I don't think. Look, any, ex any, any spreadsheet, you can. Like, okay. any spreadsheet is awesome. Essentially, what I'm saying is if you can take the data out in a structured format and give it to, to people with tooling that they are more familiar with, and they can do a lot of the slicing and dicing, which we would otherwise have to write in coding and put out a nice web front end onto it, I think that's awesome. Yeah, so LibreOffice, any open source alternative. I'm, I'm you know, pragmatic about it. I don't mind as long as you're using something like that. You've been talking a lot about bylaws, and I was thinking that there's potentially a gap or interest for like citizens to actually have a better interface to how these bylaws come about. You know, because it's been published in the government gazette, but I think very few few people actually know what's there, and also the government doesn't maybe know how popular or unpopular the decisions are. So, like maybe like something like a web app or a phone app that polls people, you know, like that does like a polling service, you know, when it announces like what the government like has in mind, and then like kind of query the public about it, you know, like something like that might also be quite interesting. Absolutely, I agree with that. So, when bylaws are, are promulgated or before they're promulgated, the um, legislation requires that the the municipalities go through a public consultation process. And every now and again, you'll see an email, maybe if you follow your city, maybe mentioning this, right? Very little, very few people know about it. And I completely agree. What I'd love to do with our bylaws platform is when we've got some momentum behind it, is actually also use it as a way to say, here are draft bylaws. What do you think of that, right? Let's use something like the medium, the comments that medium uses, or if you've heard of the, the web service hypothesis for, for annotating web documents. Let's use something like that to actually have some discussion around a document. Um, and I think a great example of where public participation really had a huge impact was in Cape Town a couple of years ago, they wanted to put through a new liquor bylaw. And that was going to severely restrict the sale of liquor um, on Sundays and on well, the weekends in general and uh, at pubs during the week, sort of late into the, the evening. So that really has an impact on most of our lives, right? That's critical. <laughs> and so, thankfully, a lot of people got uh, sort of jumpy about this and commented on it, and there was good feedback. And it, the actual bylaw that came through is a complete opposite of that. They broadened liquor hours, right? 
it's controlled and stuff, but like huge win, huge win for public participation. And I want that to happen when they're telling you how many dogs you can have and whether you, know, whether you can spit in the street. That's, that's like managed by a bylaw. Bylaws have the weirdest things. But yeah, absolutely, like improving public participation, such a huge thing. Uh, any more questions? <laughs> um, do you work with Adrian Frith with some of the map stuff? Um, Adrian came and did a talk with us um, actually six, seven months ago. Uh, yeah, so we chat to him a lot. Um, and actually, that, that's a really good point. So there are a bunch of people sort of doing this in South Africa uh, in a sort of on their own, on the quiet. There may be one or two blogs. And what we're trying to do is, is raise awareness around that, that people are doing some great work like Adrian. And there are other people who... Who, who like um, Paul Berkowitz, who talks about elections and, and wards and uses some great maps to do it. Um, and just raise awareness around this and grow that community and, and get people to sort of collaborate and help out. Because it's not like nobody out there is doing this. People are doing it. We just don't really know that much about it. So things like open bylaws, they should really be done by government. I mean, it's, it's pretty clear that it's you guys just doing what should be a government digital service. Is there any sort of, or what's your strategy for some sort of rapprochement with the government to, if possible, make that happen at a sort of government level? That's a great question. Um, you're right, government should be doing these things. Governments, pol politicians, it's a slow moving machine, right? Uh, you have to choose your approach, you have to play the long game, uh, if in two or three years' time, open bylaws was entirely redundant because it was being done by government, I'd be entirely happy with that. That is success, right? Um, so I think the way you actually practically go about doing it is we're starting to talk to cities, uh, city of Cape Town, city of Durban, um, to embed fellows um, into those cities. So that'll be a six, uh, six months or year-long uh, uh, sort of fellowship. And the goal there is to try and drive change from within. And a lot of that is just making governments aware of what they could be doing differently. Um, like, as I said, right, s people realizing, oh, I can use Excel to do this is a huge, like, the, the, the penny drops. And if we can do the same thing within government, then it doesn't need to be a forcing this onto them. It can be a, they're calling for it as well, which generates economic opportunities, generates jobs and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it needs to be a slow game. Um, but we're playing it, and I think we're hopefully starting to make see, see change there. And what I would love to see maybe is, you know, we're, we're saying to governments, we build a platform to make it easier to publish bylaws. We want to help you use this platform because it's going to save you time and save you money. So it's a cost-saving exercise, and it should be at the end of the day. If anything we're doing here is actually going to slow government down and make it more expensive, it's not going to win. Right? The whole point here is we're trying to make it more cost-effective, more streamlined, and we know technology can help with that. We just have to help them understand how. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. Okay, in which case, let's thank Greg again. I, sorry, one, one more thing, Neil. Sorry, I've, in, in grand tradition, we're hiring. We have a sabbatical <laughs> opportunity. Um, at the bottom there, we have a paid sabbatical opportunity. If you're interested in working with us, if you're sort of a, um, you've got tech skills and you want to make a difference, please get in touch with us. Um, it's, it's an awesome opportunity to do something a bit different, and then you can get back to your regular day job if you want to at the end of the day. Thanks. <laughs>